Thank you. <laughs> it's an honor to be here today to represent class six, so thank you very much and thank you to the Academy. My scientific life began here in the Sierra Nevada mountains. I would like to thank my mother and father who first introduced me to the Sierras, and I am also very grateful to my brothers and friends and family who explored uh, the Sierras with me. And I really appreciate them making the trip to Washington, so thank you very much. Now, of course, plants give us more than beauty. They give us food. I chose to study rice because it's the staple food for more than half the world's popul population. Now, most rice farmers cultivate very small plots of land. One of the aims of plant and microbial biology research is to make smallholder farming more productive and resilient in the face of a changing climate. This slide shows that the human population is projected to reach more than 9.7 billion people by 2050, from the current 7.9 billion. In addition to having more people to feed on the planet, we are consuming more calories than we have done in the past. Some estimates indicate that if we're unable to reduce crop loss or alter our consumption patterns, we will need to double the yield of the major crops in the next few decades to keep up with food demands. In many areas of the developing world, 60% of potential crop yield is lost to disease and environmental stress. Climate change presents additional challenges, including rising temperatures and a higher incidence of pest diseases, droughts, and floods. If the food system is to withstand climate change and sustain a growing population, it must become more resilient and efficient. Crop genetics improvement will continue to be a key component of enhancing resilience of our farms. Today I'll describe two projects with the goal of enhancing resistance in rice. These projects include disease resistance and flood tolerance. To minimize losses, farmers rely on rice varieties that carry genes for resistance. In the front is a field infected by the, a microbe that causes bacterial leaf blight disease, which is the most serial, serious bacterial disease of Asia and Africa and can reduce yields up to 50%. In the background is a rice variety carrying a gene for resistance, so no pesticides are being sprayed. Planting resistant varieties has been an important strategy for farmers for more than 100 years because it's the most economically effective and environmentally responsible approach for fighting disease. So if farmers plant these um, uh, plants uh, with resistance genes, they don't, they don't have to spray. Now, despite the widespread planting of resistant varieties, when I started my research on rice, biologists had not yet isolated or characterized these resistance genes. So it was a very exciting time. In the 1990s, my lab launched a project to uncover the genetic basis of resistance to bacterial blight disease. Here you can see a close-up of a leaf infected with the causal bacterium, which is called Xanthomonas oryzae, Pathovar oryzae which we call XOO. It has a distinctive yellow pigment, and you can see the bacteria then oozing out of the, the leaf. The disease resistance trait that I'll tell you about was first described about 50 years ago in a wild species of rice called Oryzae longestaminata. In the 1990s, International Rice Research Institute plant breeder and World Fruit Prize winner Gertif Kusch and colleagues mapped the resistance trait and named it XA21. His team showed that XA21 confers resistance to all strains of the bacterium that were known at that time. My lab team, led by two postdocs, Guliang Wang and Wenyuan Song, used a map-based cloning approach to isolate the gene conferring the XA21 resistance trait. On the top, you can see a pair of rice leaves that were inoculated with the bacterium at the tip of the leaf. And on the bottom are leaves of rice engineered with the XA21 gene. The plants engineered with XA21 are remarkably more resistant to infection. We sequenced a gene and found that XA21 encodes a receptor kinase with an extracellular leucine-rich repeat domain, shown in blue, and transmembrane domain, and an intracellular kinase domain. 
The predicted structure suggested that the leucine-rich repeat domain could recognize the microbe and then transduce a response into the cell via the kinase domain. It turns out the rice immune receptor XA21 is broadly representative of a large class of plant and animal receptors that recognize and respond to microbial molecules. So, for example, XA21 shares remarkable similarities with the fly toll receptor as well as the mice TLR4 receptors. They share, also share very similar kinase domains that associate with the receptors in animals but are integral to the XA21 receptor and other plant receptors that have been uh, discovered. Now, together, these studies have advanced our fundamental understanding of how very diverse organisms recognize and respond to infection. We next wanted to identify the microbial molecule that activates infection. This slide represents many years of research carried out by the talented researchers shown here. We identified a small sulfated peptide and a transport system that secretes a peptide out of the bacterial cell, where it then binds directly with the XA21 receptor. Specific, this specific binding of the microbial peptide with the plant XA21 receptor leads to a very robust resistance response. This timeline shows 30 years of plant resistance gene cloning and highlights the rapid and exciting growth of this important field of research. The cloning of the first plant resistance gene was published in 1992. XO21 was isolated in 1995. The colors represent the proposed mechanism of resistance function. XA21 is representative of a class of cell surface receptors that bind directly with their ligands, and that's shown in dark blue. The red is a very large class of intracellular receptors that many of you have probably heard about called nucleotide binding site leucine rich repeat receptors. So these studies have shown that immune receptors in plants and animals are remarkably similar. Um, they, the receptors, as I've told you, detect specific molecules secreted by microbes, and this specific interaction then triggers a resistance response. So in the current pandemic, we are all now aware that microbes can evolve variants that plant and animal immune systems cannot recognize. Uh, in a sense, this is an evolutionary arms race. So in plants, that leads to susceptibility. If the receptor cannot recognize that microbial pathogen, you get susceptibility to infection. Now, our research studies of XA21 and its microbial ligand has led to valuable insights into the molecular genetic basis of this arms race. And one of our current goals is to use these insights to engineer new receptors that can recognize evolutionary variants and develop crops with resistance to microbes with which we currently have no effective means uh, to control. As I mentioned, climate change presents new challenges for farmers. Consider flooding. Rice grows well in standing water, but most rice varieties will die if they're submerged for more than three days. This is an image of kids walking through their family's rice field in Bangladesh following a flood. This family won't be able to harvest rice from the center of this field. As the climate changes, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change predicts that floods will increase in duration and intensity. 25% of the world's rice is grown in flood-prone areas that's shown in the circle here. In South and Southeast Asia, 4 million tons of rice, enough to feed 30 million people, is lost every year to flooding. This region is home to 70 million rice farmers, many who live on less than $3 a day. Rice breeders have long known about a variety of rice found in eastern India that can tolerate submergence. In the 1980s, breeders used a conventional breeding approach to introduce this trait um, into rice. However, the resulting rice varieties were rejected by rice farmers because the breeding dragged in undesirable traits such as lower yield and a poor flavor. At the time, breeders didn't have a way to introduce the trait more precisely. 
About 25 years ago, my colleagues Dave McKill and Kenok Shu mapped this important trait called Submergence Tolerance 1, or SUB1. In 1995, we began a collaboration to isolate the gene encoding the SUB1 trait. We were able to successfully isolate the gene using a map-based cloning strategy. On the left is a conventional rice variety that was grown for two weeks, submerged for two weeks, and then allowed to recover for two weeks. On the right is a rice plant that we genetically engineered in my lab with a new gene we named Sub1A. You can see that the genetically engineered plants survived the flood. So we were uh, amazed and, uh, of course, very excited that the effects of, the si of a single gene were so clear. At that point, we, had, we were certain that we had identified the gene that made the plants tolerant to flooding. But how exactly did it work? Over the years, a talented group of researchers have begun to uncover the mechanisms with which sub-1 enables plants to endure complete submergence for prolonged periods. It's known that submergence creates a low oxygen environment and the accumulation of a plant hormone called ethylene. In the absence of sub a plants grow rapidly, which depletes their carbohydrate uh, and energy reserves, and eventually the plant will, will just die. In the presence of sub a ethylene activates sub a transcription. We found that sub a activates uh, ex uh, expression of ethylene-responsive transcription factors. Dr. ming Che Shu's team showed that a low-oxygen environment stabilizes these transcription factors, and these factors then activate expression of submergence-responsive uh, genes. Professor Julia Bailey Sears team showed that sub one a also downregulates cell elongation and carbohydrate breakdown and induces ethanolic fermentation. Together, these activities conserve the shoot meristem and energy reserves during the transient flooding period, resulting in submergence tolerance. So does this trait work in the field? And of course, that was our ultimate goal, to try to help um, smallholder rice farmers. And the answer is yes, it does. So I'm going to show you a four-month time-lapse video, and it shows a sub-1 variety developed by Dave McKill at the International Rice Research Institute using marker-assisted breeding. And field trials were led by Dave, Abdel Ismail, and colleagues. On the left is the... A rice variety caught IR64 with the sub-1A gene. On the right is the conventional variety. At the beginning, both grow normally. However, the field is flooded for 17 days, the conventional variety doesn't thrive. In contrast, you can see that the sub-1A variety recovers rapidly from the flood. In these controlled field experiments, the sub-1 variety produced threefold more grain than the conventional variety. I love this video because it shows the power of plant genetics. In 2008, our entire team visited farmers in India and Bangladesh who had planted uh, another variety that carried uh, sub-1 called Swarna sub-1. And this image shows uh, the fields after uh, a natural flood. So floods have been occurring um, uh, with increasing frequency over the last four years. And you can see very clearly that Sorna sub-1 variety grew well, and it had a 60% yield advantage compared with the conventional variety called Sorna. In the absence of flooding, sub-1 rice grows as, as well as conventional varieties. Last year, more than 6 million farmers grew sub-1 rice. Now, key goals of sustainable agriculture include economic prosperity and social equity. Kyle Emmerich and colleagues at UC Berkeley and Tufts carried out an experiment to determine who benefited from the sub-1 technology. Their study was located in the state of Odisha and eastern India, as shown here. In red are higher elevation areas, and in yellow are lower elevation areas, historically occupied by thousands of years of, by people belonging to minority social groups. The researchers randomly divided 128 villages into two groups, a treatment group where farmers were provided with Sorna sub-1 seed, and a control group where farmers continued to grow their chosen variety, most often Sorna. And this investigation confirmed early results led by Abdel and others that Sorna sub-1 delivers robust yield advantages to farmers during flooding and does not affect yield under non-flood conditions. 
These results show that most of the benefits of the sub-1 technology accrue to the minority social groups who are among the poorest farmers in the world. I hope these examples give you a sense that it's an exciting time for plant and microbial biology and agriculture. I am confident that the global agricultural community will continue to make important innovations in plant genetics and breeding that will enhance the, resilien the resilience of our agricultural system. Despite this tremendous progress, we still have plenty of work to do. We must not only advance the science forward, but we must also engage the public in the research that we do. Society will only embrace scientific advances if citizens are well informed and trust that the scientific process is transparent and rigorous. Thank you to everyone who joined my lab at UC Davis. I am incredibly grateful for the ingenuity, creativity, and friendship of my lab mates, my collaborators, and my wonderful mentors. It has been a great privilege, privilege to work with so many wonderful researchers. And um, the research in my laboratory was supported by the organizations listed here. Thank you. Thank you.